107.14 says, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bonds apart. Praise mm -hmm. God. You may have a seat. We got a bunch of announcements for you this morning. Next Sunday, we'll be having another baptism service and a fellowship dinner immediately following the service. Please bring a salad and a dessert to share. And our youth programs will be starting October 3rd. Jessica will be in the foyer after church to sign your kids up. So if they're between the ages of four years and 12th grade, be sure to stop by and see her on your way out. Young adults also it starts on October 3rd, and Jessica has devotions, devotional books, um, prepared for the adults all the way through the, your kids' ages, and I would encourage you to check those out so that we can be uh, encouraging those devotions along with the kids. We have a dozen people signed up for the Futures Banquet on October the 8th. If you'd like to attend, please sign up as there is limited seating. The Restore New England Prayer Gathering, gathering will be held Friday, October 15th at 6.30 at the Union Baptist Church. The guys on the, in the back are going to play a video that explains a little more about that. Or not. Or not. Okay. Um, then Christy. Oh, okay. Uh, are you going to be able to do the OCC video? No. Okay. Oh. Well, there was going to be a video on uh, <laughs> our kickoff today of uh, collecting things, which you guys have done a great job. I want to actually say thank you. We have a lot of school supplies, and now we're collecting toiletry items. So washcloth, soap, toothbrush, no toothpaste, comb brush, hair things for girls, um, those kinds of things we're going to be collecting for the next three weeks. And um, so, okay. Here we go. Here's three some, some children some open the shoe boxes. They're so excited. Those faces just transform. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. The mouth is wide open, the voice is raised, smiles are all over. That box brings joy. We're right now in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, it knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Churches are doing big things with Operation Christmas Child. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. We couldn't do it without them. With this box, they do get the gospel story. They do hear about Jesus. It has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ. I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in fill shoe boxes? Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. After receiving the shoe boxes, the children will be invited to go to The Greatest Journey, which is a 12-lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes The Greatest Journey, they graduate and receive a Bible in their own language. <laughs> When the light of the gospel is turned on, that changes everything. Churches are being planted, lives are being changed, communities are being transformed. The Word of God is spreading. The Gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. 
it is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. I would like to ask you to consider packing shoeboxes year-round. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Okay, so we're collecting things now for our packing party at the beginning of November. Um, or if you want to do your own shoe box, there are boxes in the back, and I'm getting about 100 more tomorrow. So we have plenty of those, too. It makes a huge difference in the life of a child, mostly because they get to hear about Jesus. It has no, knows no boundaries and no borders. Mm -hmm. so, um, mm -hmm. so thank you. Switching gears, we're going to be uh, singing for our first song in our set, Chain Breaker. And the reason I like Chain Breaker is because definitely Jesus breaks the chains uh, of sin so that we can be saved. But when we're saved, sometimes we get tempted. And um, temptation isn't sin, but if we give into temptation, that, that can be sinful. And, uh, but we have the power to say no to temptation mm. because of Jesus. Mm. And uh, this verse, uh, to me, is one of my lifetime verses that has to do with um, breaking the chains of falling into temptation. And it's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted above your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Mm -hmm. So stand with us and uh, as we start Chain Breaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need you guys to clap with us. There we go. So sing with me. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies, if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got Shake it, say. 
uh, it shows us that Jesus, when he ministered to people, he touched them. Uh, he healed the leper. He touched the leper. He, he uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the crowds, people, uh, they mobbed him, uh, bringing their children, trying to get him to touch them and to touch him. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus had the physical contact with those he loved. He just loved being with his creation. He took pleasure and joy in so many of them. And in coming this morning and, and singing these, these great songs, um, I, I just was finding myself saying, Jesus, uh, what a privilege. What a privilege to call you Jesus, to call you Savior, to know that you love me. And that you're here present you've invited us into your presence these are incredible so as we pray think about not the asking not the petitions which and they're okay but let's think about what we are worshiping Jesus for this morning this very moment and let's lift up a chorus of thanksgiving to him telling him how much we appreciate all that he has done. We're eternally indebted to him. So let's pray. Father, <clears throat> we celebrate every single day the incredible gift you gave to us of Jesus. <laughs> and if that were not enough, you insisted on giving us the Holy Spirit to keep our focus going toward you to understand your word to to teach us to encourage and to comfort and bless us moment by moment each day oh how we need you so thank you lord thank you for receiving our worship <laughs> as we think about all of eternity ahead worship is going to take on a new meaning but we want to practice here. We want to experience today what it means to be in the presence knowingly we're with our God and our Savior. And so we need your touch today. We need to know that you care, that you love us, that you are as eager to know us as you were when you created us. So we worship you. Please receive these thoughts, these concerns, even these burdens that we lift up in the place at the foot of the cross this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to allow all those involved in Children's Church the opportunity to be dismissed. And uh, if I could ask a couple of our deacons, um, we have a chart this morning of the book of Revelation. And if you didn't get one of those, if you just raise your hand and Mike's got some and he'll, he'll, get, a, he'll get one to you. Um, I want to refer to that this morning, and it's uh, something you can keep for future reference as well um, as we go through the book of Revelation. Well, it's good to see you all this morning and glad that we can gather together in the name of the Lord freely and, uh, and worship him today. And uh, I know uh, sickness has been hitting some of us, uh, and so all of those of you who are joining us online this morning, we want to welcome you. 
Uh, we are going to go back to uh, the book of Revelation this morning, and uh, just before we do, uh, let's uh, just ask God to open our hearts to his word. Uh, Father, I thank you for who you are, and as we were reminded, uh, Fred reminded us the, the privilege of, um, of just worshiping you, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for for Jesus and all that he's done for us, Not the chain breaker as we sang uh, this morning, and um, Lord, just give us an appreciation of you today, and give us an understanding of your word, and and the implications of it for our lives today, uh, though, though we speak about a future day, Lord, you have given this to us uh, for a reason, and I pray that you will open our minds and hearts to understand that reason even today. Thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, you know... Uh, well, I'm gonna, I'll just introduce the sermon and say uh, we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Um, so you guys have left me a lot of time this morning. That's good. We're going to cover two chapters, Lord willing. Um, and uh, I just kind of entitled this, The Tribulation Intensifies. I didn't put this in the title, but um, if I had a subtitle, it would be What Hell on Earth Looks Like. Um, and it's a, it's a, uh, these two chapters detail the seven trumpet judgments, uh, which are part of the seventh seal, and we'll explain that in a little more detail uh, in time to come. You know, as we have been over the last week or so, thinking back to 20 years ago and, and the, the September 11th, the 9-11 attacks on our country, um, I came across something online uh, this week, and, and actually... Uh, was attributed to Anne Graham Lott uh, about an interview that she gave a couple of days after September 13th. It turns out that a lot of that was wrongly attributed to her, as sometimes happens online. Um, but uh, I, I did look up the actual transcript of that, sh uh, of that interview, and what she did say I thought was significant and relates uh, for me to um, Revelation 8 and 9. Um, the interviewer, Jane Clayson, uh, said, I've heard people say those who are religious, those who are uh, not, both those who are religious and those who are not, if God is good, how could God let this happen? Um, to that you say, and Anne Graham Lotz, uh, Billy Graham's daughter, said, I say God is also angry when he sees something like this. I would, also say, I would say also for several years now, Americans in a sense have shaken their fist at God and said, God, we want you out of our schools, our government, our business. We want you out of our marketplace. And God, who as a gentleman, has just quietly backed out of our national and political life, our public life, removing his hand of blessing and protection. We need to turn to God, first of all, and say, God, we're sorry we have treated you this way, and we invite you now to come into our national life. We put our trust in you. We have our trust in God on our coins, we need to practice it. And at the, inter at the end of the interview, I mean, she said several other significant things, but um, Jane Clayson said, this event has changed us forever. I know you believe that. Going forward as a nation, what do you say about that? Remember, this is 20 years ago, but I think it's just as appropriate to us today. She said, well, I pray that God will use this event to change us forever in a positive way, and that will strengthen our faith in him. I thought of all those people who have died in this tragedy. It doesn't matter right now what political affiliation they had or what denomination they belonged to or what religion or what color, what the color of their skin was or their stock portfolio. What matters is their relationship with God. I would like to see Americans begin to focus on some of the primary things and some of the things that are more important than just, you know, entertainment and pleasure and making more money. You know, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Anne Graham Lantz uh, said there, and if it was true then, it's uh, more so true uh, today. Um, you know, when it comes to the terrible judgments in the book of Revelation, the question often comes to our minds, uh, why would a good and loving God allow this or do this? You know, we forget, I think, sometimes uh, that God is also 
not just a good and live, loving God, but he's a holy and just God who loves sinners uh, but hates sin and must punish it. And we forget, too, I think, that no one has paid a greater price to rescue us from our sin um, and provide forgiveness and eternal life and a relationship with him than God himself. You know, God paid the ultimate price by sending his son, Jesus, to die in our place and for our sin. Who sends their son to die for their enemies? God does. Um, as believers, I think this should both sober us and impel us to share the good news with those around us before it is too late. And, and you'll see in, um, and I'll, I'll have you refer to your chart because it's hard. We have it online, I believe, uh, Aza, if you can pull it up for us, but it's a little hard to see on there, so I wanted you to have a copy of it. But it's a kind of a chart of Revelation, and just to kind of bring us back into the context, uh, the first three chapters over on the left are the letters to the churches that we went through. Um, then chapters four and five are the worship service in heaven, you know, that great, amazing worship service in heaven, and, and the presentation of the scroll with the seven seals, and, and the question about who was worthy, the search for one who was worthy to open it, and finally, the lamb who uh, appeared as slain uh, appeared, and he is declared worthy to open, uh, to open the scroll, and of course, that's Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 6, we see uh, the beginning of the opening of that scroll, the beginning of the great tribulation, we call it, and the six seal judgments that are in chapter 6. Um, and, uh, you know, we remember the four horsemen of the apocalypse and, and the, 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 the war and death and destruction that, was, uh, that came upon the earth and, and uh, terrible, terrible judgments. Um, and then the martyring of uh, believers and their prayer. And, uh, and then finally, um, the, the last and sixth seal. And then in chapter 7, we kind of took an interlude, a parenthesis. Um, and it was a parenthesis to tell us about the sealing of the 144,000 Jewish believers. Some would think they were Jewish evangelists. That God seals with his seal on their forehead during the tribulation to protect them. Uh, from, from these judgments and from, um, from, the tribu from all that's going on in the tribulation. Um, and so we see God's protection over these, these Jewish believers. In chapters 8 and 9, we kind of pick up the flow chronologically again of tribulation events, and we pick it up with what's called the seventh seal. And I think we'll see uh, as we go on that the seventh seal... Uh, that within these seven seals are all of the judgments of Revelation and the tribulation. You have the, the seal judgments, you have the trumpet judgments, and you have the bowl judgments. There's seven of each. But all of those are really contained under the seal judgments. Um, because the seventh seal is, in effect, we're going to find out, the seven trumpet judgments. And in turn, the seventh trumpet is, in effect, the seven... Um, the seven bowl judgments. So um, th this, these chapters uh, contain, uh, verse, uh, chapters 8 and 9, contain the first six trumpet judgments, and uh, the last three are sometimes called the three woes or the three warning woes. Um, so, you know, I'll try and uh, un unravel some of that for us as we go through, but, um, but let's dive into chapter 8. It begins with um, God's preparation for this moment. And it says, When the lamb, lamb opened the seventh seal, so now we're on the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. You know, it's an interesting thing that happens here. Um, as before the opening, or as the, as the Lamb, as Christ opens this seventh seal, meaning it's, it's coming from God, it's coming from Christ, um, there is this silence in heaven for half an hour. You know, I call this God's moment of silence. It was more than one moment. It was, it was 30 minutes of silence. Um, uh, but this silence is a kind of foreboding uh, ominous, dramatic pause um, 
you know, heaven has been filled. We saw in chapters 5 and 6 with the loud, raucous worship of God. Um, that's what's going on in heaven. And as, as Jesus opens this seventh, seal, this seventh seal, heaven goes silent. Um, it, it's kind of an awesome picture. Now, all of us have probably been in a situation, a very reverential and a situation where, where there's a moment of silence, as there was on 9-11, and, and many times we, we're, we're involved with that, where something terrible has happened, and, and in memory of those people, um, we, we had a moment of silence. We used to say a moment of prayer, but now we have silence. But, um, but um, when everyone is just quiet, and if you're ever in a large crowd where that crowd goes quiet for 60 seconds, you begin to think, wow, this is a long time to be silent, you know? I mean, it's, it, it kind of sets you back a little bit, you know? It, it sobers us a little bit when we just have to stand for 60 seconds and reflect meditatively on whatever tragedy or thing we're remembering. So imagine in heaven when heaven goes silent for 30 minutes because of what is to come. Uh, it, it's kind of an ominous warning. Uh, there aren't, I think, very many times we see heaven go silent, but this is one of those times. And so into that ominous silence, seven angels come uh, when, when that is done Seven angels who stand before God. Um, and these angels seem especially connected to trumpet and bowl judgments. Um, we, we see them in verse 6 and chapter 15 and 16 and 17 and 21. We see these seven, uh, same seven angels. Um, you remember the four horsemen were introduced by the four living creatures. Now the rest of the judgments are going to be often associated with these seven angels. Um, Many believe these are very powerful angels in heaven. Um, you know, the, the hierarchy in heaven, that these are seven powerful angels who stand in the presence of God. I mean, these are angels who are right there with God. And, um, and you know, it reminds me that, that God is, um, he's never understaffed. You know, we hear a lot about um, businesses and stuff. Everybody's is closing down because they can't, don't have enough staff and lots of other businesses are struggling and, and we're short of help and we're understaffed. Can I say that God is never understaffed? Um, he always has the resources to carry out his sovereign will. He is all powerful and he is going to carry it out. And these seven angels represent seven powerful beings who stand ready at an instant to accomplish God's will. And they are given a very sobering task um, because he's completely in control. It says these, um, these seven angels who stand before God, that seven trumpets were given to them. You know, when I, I first started dating Christy years ago, eons ago, centuries ago, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> sorry, hon, I was talking about me. <laughs> 39 years ago, 40 some years ago. <laughs> you know, I went to her house in Columbus and, you know, growing up in Vermont, you know, I was in the city, you know, with a city girl in her house and, and, and all of a sudden, uh, this loud siren, I mean, it was blaringly loud, came out across the whole city. And, uh, and I was like, what in the world is that? And, and it turns out that every Wednesday at noon, they test the tornado warning system and they have huge loudspeakers that go all over the neighborhoods in this city and blare out this, this alarm sound. <laughs> and I was thinking of that when I thought about these trumpets. These, these trumpets are alarm sound announcing something terrible is coming. Um, and trumpets in Scripture, and particularly in Israel, were used for a number of things. They were used to, as a call to battle, you know, uh, Joel 2.1, you know, raise the trumpet in Zion and, and declare the day of the Lord. Or, or in, in human battles, they, they announced uh, the coming battle and the call to battle. They announced the calls to public assemblies. Every important public assembly that was called, they blew the trumpets. 
Uh, you remember they blew the trumpets when the walls of Jericho came down? Um, they were also used for all kinds of special occasions. Every important day in Israel was accompanied by the blowing, in, in this case, the joyful blowing of the trumpets. Um, and so trumpets were, were used often to announce things. And here they signal, signify the announcement of God's perfect, because there's seven of them, judgments. Um, now some... Uh, some look on these trumpet and bowl judgments as, you know, the same series of judgments. You know, you have the trumpets and then you, I mean, you have the seals and then you have the trumpets that kind of go back and fill in a little more and the bowls that go back and fill in a little more. But I, I don't think that's, a, a, I don't agree with that interpretation. And, and here's the reason why. When we come to the seventh seal, no content is given uh, in ch- verses one and two here. It doesn't say, now the seal is specifically this, like it did with all the other six. What it does is it introduces the trumpet judgments. And the same thing happens when we get to the seventh trumpet. No content is given. Instead, it's just the bowl judgments are given, uh, the seven bowl judgments. Um, So I think, uh, and, and secondly, I think there's no precise definition of the seventh seal as there is with the first six. Um, Revelation 11, 15 and following details, I think, what, what the, these, um, these judgments accomplish. And what they accomplish is the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord in Christ. Um, and then thirdly, there's no mention of trumpets or bowls in the scroll in chapter 5. You know, when we saw this scroll introduced, it had seven seals. It didn't have seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. It just had seven seals, I think indicating that all of the judgments are contained in those seven seals um, because some come out of the other. So just a little, a little understanding, trying to give us a little understanding of the connection of these. The second thing after this, this uh, sobering um, preparation is the picture we're given of the pleasing prayers of the saints in verses 3 through 5. And it says, Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Um, so the first thing we encounter here is another angel. Um, and there's, there's some debate about who exactly this angel is. They're, they're, it's not named. Uh, it's, he's different from the, the first seven. Some have even considered that this angel might be Christ, or as he is called in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, because uh, of the kind of priestly work that he's doing here. Um, while that's a possibility, I think it's probably just another high-ranking angel. One of the reasons I think that is the word another here. In Greek, you can have two words, another of the same kind and another of a different kind. This is the word alos, which means another of the same kind. So for me, it indicates it's another angelic being uh, rather than Christ. Um, so another angel came, a very powerful angel, no doubt, and stood at the altar with a golden censer and offers this incense with the prayers of the saints. Now this is a picture, on, uh, this is drawing from an, a picture in the Old Testament of the tabernacle. And Isa, I think we have a, a picture of a diagram of uh, the Old Testament tabernacle there. Um, see if we, Yeah, we can get it up. I can't see it on that screen. But if you see, if you see on, on uh, the screen here, this is a kind of a diagram of the Old Testament tabernacle. You know, you had um, the outer court as you, as you come through the E, the entrance there on the right. Um, and, and you see the first thing you encounter is the bronze altar or the offer, altar of burnt offering where, where sacrifices were made for sin. And, and all the sacrifices that were required in the Old Testament, the laver, uh, the priest washed with what was behind that. Um, and then as you come into the tabernacle proper, into the inner courts, the first thing you encounter, of course, is the, ho- the holy place, which is the first you know, two-thirds there of the tabernacle. And you have the table of showbread on your right, and you have the the candle, um, the, the menorah or the, the candlestick on the left, 
And then it, you'll see right near the front of that, heading towards the Holy of Holies, is the altar of incense or the golden altar. Um, that altar was directly in front. They pray, place it a little back, but it was directly in front of the curtain that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And of course, in the Holy of Holies is the ark, which represents the presence of God. Um, and the whole high priest could only go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. But that in, into the other part, the priests went on a regular basis, and one of the you know they they changed the table of showbread. They um, made sure that to that the menorah was lit, and and they also offered incense on the golden altar. And kind of the picture here is is as that incense is offered, it drifts through the screen into the presence of God, and is a sweet smelling offering to God. That. That the smoke from that um, golden altar, the altar of incense, would fill the whole tabernacle with this sweet smelling uh, aroma of, of incense, and then it would ascend into uh, up above and, and into the presence of God Himself. Well, there's a lot of a spiritual significance to that. Um, and, and we're going to bring this out in these verses because. Um, we, we see, first of all, that this other angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. So, so we have here in heaven a, 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 a type again, or, or really the, the Old Te Testament tabernacle is a type of the, the heavenly tabernacle. And he holds a golden censer. A censer was just a golden a bowl um, that they put um, the incense in the, to hold the incense. Um, and, um, you know, when God gave Moses the instructions for the tabernacle, he, he was very specific that it had to be made exactly according to the pattern. And in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, we read that part of the reason for that is it was a pattern of a heavenly tabernacle or dwelling place of God in heaven. Um, and so, so here we're dealing with the heavenly uh, the heavenly. Um, uh, origin of, of that. So this, this angel comes with a, a golden censer, and it says he was given much incense uh, to offer along with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Um, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So, so what was pictured in the Old Testament in type is happening in reality in this, um, in, in this revelation uh, from what's going on in heaven that John has. Um, and there's a lot of significance to this. Um, they're, they're, the, the incense here represents the worship and the prayers that are based on sacrifice. Um, you know, there's a, I think all of these things are a type. Um, you know, they had to take coals from the bronze altar, the altar of sacrifice, to, to put the incense on. And the incense, I believe, um, and I think that represents Christ's sacrifice for us. There, there's a whole... Christology to the Old Testament uh, picture of the tabernacle here. So you have the altar of sacrifice. Who was sacrificed on our behalf? Christ was. Whose blood was shed on our behalf? And so coals from that altar are taken in this censer. Um, and then incense is added. What is the incense? The incense, I think, represents the person and the work of Christ. So we have the sacrificial death of Christ, the, pers the perfect person of Christ, the, the sweet-smelling incense, and together they're offered on the incense offering, the golden offering, um, the golden altar before God. Um, and, and along with them are our are, are prayers. And I think the significance of that is this. Our prayers are based on what? They're based on the fact that Christ died for us, sacrificed himself for us, that he lived a perfect life, that he was God's incense, as it were, and, and that as based on the work and the person of Christ, our prayers are acceptable to God. They smell good to God. They're pleasing to God. 
So there's a great picture here of Christ's person and work, the incense that's giving meaning and acceptance to the prayers of the saints. You know, our prayers are heard only because of Christ's person and sacrifice. Um, But I just want to stop there and say, this is great news. (laughs) God, the God of heaven, hears our prayers. You know, this is what I think Fred was trying to tell us this morning. You know, what a privilege we have that the God of the universe listens to and hears the prayers of believers. Why? Because of Christ's sacrificial death and his perfect life. Ah, It gives efficacy. It gives effectiveness to our prayers. Are you glad that God hears our prayers? Amen. Let me ask that again. Are you glad that God hears our prayers? Amen. Yeah, we should be saying amen. You know, and and not only that, God, God doesn't just hear our prayers. He appreciates our prayers. They smell good to him like that incense offering. When we pray to God, God is pleased with that. God says, oh, wow, I love this. My, my sons and daughters are praying, you know, and it comes up like a sweet aroma, like perfume, like fragrance to God himself. He appreciates our prayers. Our prayers are pleasing to him. Isn't that great news? That when we pray, God's pleased. He loves it when we pray. Um, why don't we pray more? <laughs> you know, our our. our you know, and, and I want to say also, God isn't obligated to hear the prayers of unbelievers. There's no coals there. There's no sacrifice of Christ there. There's no perfect person and work of Christ represented there. There's nothing for those prayers to go up to God on. You know, sometimes we, we, you know, we, we think God answers every prayer. God isn't obligated to answer any prayers of those who haven't come through Jesus Christ. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I I, I will tell you, I believe that God does answer prayers of unbelievers at times. Um, I think it's part of the way I've heard over and over again that God draws people to himself, you know? He's so gracious that that he can choose. Of course, he knows those prayers. It's not that he doesn't hear them, (laughs) Um, but but he's not obligated to answer them, but sometimes in his grace, he does. Um, because God causes his rain to shine on the, the just and the unjust. Um, but God does hear our prayers. God appreciates our prayers. Um, and then, um, finally, uh, we see in this passage that as the prayers ascend, the judgment descends. You know, the prayers of the saints go up before God and this angel, and... and um, And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. So the contents of um, the the censer changes from incense to fire from the altar. And he throws that fire on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. A couple of things. When it talks here about the prayers of the saints, what prayers is he talking about? And what saints is he talking about? Um, You know, if we go back to Revelation chapter 6, if you want to just flip back for a minute, you remember that the fifth seal, uh, it says when he, um, uh, Revelation 6, 9 through 11 says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had. Um, not exactly, um, you know, I mean, a tough word for them to hear. But these, I believe that these prayers are the prayers of the tribulation saints. It could be the prayers of all the saints of all ages. But, but I think specifically the prayers of these tribulation saints. And, and they, they cried out to God for justice. They cried out to God for vindication. 
They, they, they were putting it in his hands. And they cried out to him. They were being killed for, for the testimony of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Um, and they cried out to God. You know, God heard those prayers. God knew those prayers. Um, he didn't discount those prayers. Um, and the terrible judgments that are about to fall on the earth as, you know, the peals of thunder, rum, thunder rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake are kind of, you know, the shaking before the storm um, are an indication of that. It is going to be God's judgment on a rebellious world and also the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Those, those, those saints are praying not just that God will make things right on the earth, but that also he will establish his good kingdom on earth. Don't we pray that in the Lord's Prayer? Um, you know, we, we say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In, in effect, we are praying for that. We're, we are praying for this same thing. Before God's kingdom is come and established on earth, there is going to come a time of judgment. And that's what the book of Revelation uh, talks about. The point is, as uh, one of my um, Bible scholar friends said, the point is that after the prayer ascends with the incense, then the judgment descends with the coals of fire from the altar. You know, there's so many lessons in this for our prayer life. God hears the prayers of every believer. And our prayers are made effective by the life and the sacrifice of Christ. And our prayers are precious to him. And you know what? God answers every prayer according to his will. And his will is always good. Um, We don't always like it, but his will is always good. Can I say that our prayers move the heart and the hand of God? This too is awesome. (laughs) You know, those tribulation saints moved the hand and the heart of God to enact his plan, but in his time. Oh. And, you know, our prayers, too, move the heart and the hand of God. Now, you know, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe he's decreed the end from the beginning, and, and I don't understand it all. But I know that God determines the ends, but he also uses the means, and the means, and Jesus told us this, is our prayers. Oh. You know, they matter. Our prayers matter, whether we see it or not, and whether we know it or not. Our prayers do matter to God. And that's why we pray in faith. And when we get discouraged, can I remind us that every cry for justice, every scream for mercy, every pleading for grace is taken into account by our loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Someday, he will set the world straight. There will be a day of reckoning when God's judgment against sin is unleashed, and that will be prior to his coming to establish his perfect kingdom on earth. So what's the cash value of this? Don't stop praying. (laughs) Keep praying. Pray for revival. Pray for God to do his work. Pray for those unsaved family members and friends and associates to come to know Christ. Pray for for all of these things that God God puts on our heart to pray. Um, You know, I was telling someone last week about a story that impacted me, a book I read. um, You know, I can't remember the name of it, but it was about, it was a story of these two men who met years later One had been the descendant of slaves and one had been the descendant of slave owners. And it turns out when they looked into their histories that one was the slave owner family of the the man who was, uh, his descendants were slaves there. And they told the story of how, um, you know, the slave owners at the time didn't want um, the Christian slaves, uh, you know, our African-American brothers and sisters to, to, um, to, to practice their belief in God and their worship of God. And so they prohibited them from having um, worship services or, or church. Um, but they were so determined to do that, they would get up in the middle of the night and, you know, at midnight they'd go out and they'd meet in a barn somewhere in, in secret and, and they, would, they would pray. Um, and because they had to keep quiet, they would, they would get a big kettle and they would, they would lift up the kettle and they would pray under the kettle so that they could express themselves freely and loudly because it would be muffled by the kettle. And, and they prayed under the kettle. 
And they prayed that, that God would free them from this slavery. And they prayed for, for freedom and, and justice for their children and their grandchildren. And, and, and for years they prayed and prayed under the kettle. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, as, as American history went on and, and, and the Civil War and, and President Lincoln, you know, we abolished slavery. And, and their prayers were finally answered one day. Now, many of them didn't get to see personally the answers to those prayers. Uh, but God remembered those prayers. God took note of those prayers. And God answers, answered those prayers. And so sometimes I think for me today, that's a great visual for me. When I pray for revival, when I pray for revival for Linden Bible Church and our community and, and our country, you know, I, I, I tell the Lord, I, I might be just praying under the kettle here, Lord. Um, it may not come in my time. It may not come in my ministry. And that's okay. That's in your hands. But I'm not going to stop praying for revival. And I'm going to pray under that kettle until you bring revival someday, if that's according to your plan. You know? And I hope the, the next guy that comes in here gets to experience that. You know? Uh, but, but we need to keep praying. We shouldn't give up. We need to persevere in faith uh, in our prayer life. Got off on a rabbit trail there. But <laughs> so then we see, um, we see these very judgments performed in verses 6 through 12 where we have um, the detailing of the first four tr trumpet judgments. It's interesting that the seals and the trumpets are divided into fours and threes, uh, both of them. Maybe reasons for that. Um, but um, these first four are, are given to us in verses 6 through 12. It says, Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. So, you know, the announcement is given. They're getting ready. And then in verse 7 it says, The first angel blew his trumpet, and there fo followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Now, you know, it's, as we go through these, it's sometimes a little hard to diff difficult to determine what is literal and what is symbolic, but I try and take things literally unless I, I have a reason not to. Um, but this first trumpet judgment, this first awesome judgment, that there was 30 minutes of silence in heaven at, at, because it was so intense, um, begins an unleashing of, again, and we use this term loosely sometimes, hell on earth. Um, you know, we speak about that in, in kind of a, an, uh, uh, a casual way. But in the book of Revelation, we really see that. Um, we are going to see literally hell unleashed on earth. And it begins with this judgment of hail and fire and blood. Um, you know, if you've lived in a place where there's horrible hailstorms or if you've been exposed, as we are on TV, to, to terrible forest fires, um, and I'm not sure what the blood refers to, if it's either the aftermath or, or what it is, but um, in some way these three things um, descend upon the earth. And, um, and I will also say that um, all of these judgments are given to those who, the earth dwellers or those who dwell on the earth. And in Revelation, that is always means to unbelievers who are hostile and rebellious against God. So all of these judgments are designed for those who have rejected God, rejected Christ, and, uh, and stand uh, in hostile rebellion against him. And, um, and this first trumpet judgment results in a, a third of the earth being burned up. You know, I, I don't know if it was all in one place and it just amounted to a third or what, but um, a third of the earth being burned up. And that's going to be the pattern in the trumpet judgments that a third of many things are, are destroyed. Um, hail, fire, and blood, and a third of the earth is burned up. A third of all the trees. I was thinking about this as I, as I, as I look out the front of my house from my deck, and and I see a field full of green grass, and I see trees endlessly. <laughs> you know, we're in Vermont, in the Northeast Kingdom, 
And I thought about, wow, a third will be burned up. Nothing left. Uh It's a terrible judgment. And when you think about a third of the earth being burned up, a third of the trees, all of the grass, and that may very well include the crops, probably the result of this judgment alone would be terrible worldwide famine. Uh And so this first judgment is released. The second uh, angel blew his trumpet, trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. So the second trumpet um, angel blows his trumpet and, and that inaugurates the second trumpet judgment. And, and John is careful here in the way, the way he writes this. Something like a great mountain was, thro- uh, was thrown into the sea. Um, there's a lot of, like, it looks like this. It's like this um, language in this. So we don't know exactly what this means. Um, you know, some have speculated that it could be a great volcano um, that blows up and, and goes into the sea. And, of course, we know by experience in, in, in history that that creates tidal waves and, and tidal waves destroy things. Um, I think if I had to choose, that would probably be my, my understanding. Some think it might be a, a giant meteor that comes, a, you know, a fire object and plunges into the sea, again, causing tidal waves and, and those kinds of things. We can't say for certain, but it's something on that order. And, you know, when we look at historically, uh, when some of these things happen, the greatest um, volcano that we, we know is Krakatoa um, back in the 1800s blew up and, um, you know, tens of thousands of people were killed by the tidal waves that that created. Um, it it cre- created a, a, a dust storm that covered the earth for more than a year and cut off the sun to such a degree that even over in Europe, and it happened in Indonesia, uh, even over in Europe they called it the, the, the summer without, you know, a summer, <laughs> you know. It cooled the whole earth because of that. So these kinds of things can have tremendous impact on our world. And, uh, and this burning object uh, hitting the sea and, and probably in, in some area where, around where it hits, all of the sea creatures are killed or a third of the total living creatures in the sea are killed. Um, that's a lot of dead, stinking fish. Um, you know, I mean, a third of every creature that lives in the sea is killed. And a third of all the ships in the sea are destroyed. And the idea here is completely destroyed, um, perhaps from the tidal wave or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I've been reading lately about, you know, we go to the store and all the shelves are empty these days or half empty. And and there's a huge shipping crisis today. There isn't enough ships to ship things. And I think, what happens if a third of the ships in the world get destroyed? Um, that has tremendous implications, aside from the people on the ships. Um, so this is a terrible um, second trumpet judgment. Um, and then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The word Wormwood was a plant in um, in the Middle East that was very bitter. So um, we, you know, the the implication here is the word is um, Wormwood means bitter, Um, and in this case, poisonous. Um, So the third trumpet is this great fiery star. Uh, falls into our planet and all of the fresh water sources on earth, a third of them are poisoned by this. Um, you know, again, I was thinking back to when that meteor came over Russia, a very small little meteor, and, and the tremendous force of that meteor and the implications, the, the, the disaster that it, it, uh, it did there. It was a very small little meteor a couple years ago, and, uh, and that you know, they said it had the, the power of, you know, multiple atomic bombs. Um, so imagine a really big meteor 
hit coming through our planet. Whether it broke up and spread out and that's why everything got poisoned, I don't know. All I know is that God's word tells us that because of this great star falling from heaven, blazing like a torch, that a third of the rivers and the springs of water, the, the, um, the fresh water of earth, um, became um, bitter or poisoned. And it says, and many people died from the water. It doesn't tell us how many, but many end up dying because there's no fresh water. Um, you know, as I've gone through um, these, these trumpet judgments, it reminded me that I don't appreciate things that I take for granted. <laughs> fresh water, <laughs> you know, an ocean, um, you know, trees, green grass, crops, um, fish, um, you know, all of these things every day, we, um, you know, we, we, um, we just kind of expect to be there. Um, we we kind of take them for granted. Um, and, um, and I think this is a reminder that the God who created all of those things, which are good things, um, also designed that, um, that in his sovereignty that he can, he can take them away. Um, the fourth trumpet is in um, uh, verse 12. The fourth angel blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. Um, so the fourth trumpet is one third of all of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Um, not sure if their, their light is darkened by one-third, or if it seems to almost indicate one-third of the day was dark and one-third of the night was dark. In effect, that we moved to a 16-hour day. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but we know that there was, there's a great darkening of um, the sun, the moon, and the stars, again, which we just take for granted. Um, and... Um, you know, when we think about this, um, we think we don't want to be here to experience that. And we don't want anybody else to be here to experience that either. Um, these judgments are sobering to us. They're sobering because it helps us to understand how seriously God takes sin and rebellion against him. But it also should impel, impel, impel us as believers. Because we've got the answer, the rescue plan of God to avoid this. And that's a belief and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Um, well, the last, uh, verse 13 gives the preparation for the last three trumpet judgments. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. If you ever heard an eagle, an eagle just caw, you know, rah, rah, except this one is speaking um, and says, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets the three angels are about to blow. So these are sometimes called the three woes in chapter 9 or the last three judgments, trumpet judgments, and they are the same thing. But these apparently are especially intense, and so, um, so they're called uh, the three woes. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft arose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing into battle. 
They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as, as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is, he is called Apollyon. So the fifth trumpet is in these first 11 verses. And um, as, as this fifth angel blows his trumpet, he sees a star fallen from heaven. And the implication of the, the grammar is that it had already fallen from heaven to earth. Um, and he was given the shaft to the key of the bottomless pit. You know, as we read further in this, and especially when we get to the, the names at the end and the authority given to this one, it becomes pretty clear to me that, um, that this, this angel of the bottomless pit is Satan himself. And, you know, we know historically that, that Satan, you know, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 talk about Satan rebelling against God and, and being, um, being defeated or cast out of heaven, and he takes a third of the angels with him that become demons. And, and, but, but prophetically, um, it, it's also true that uh, and we know from the book of Job that Satan still has access to God. He's still permitted access to God in the meantime. But now he is completely thrown out of heaven um, and, and thrown down to earth. He knows his time is short. He knows scripture. He knows this. And so we are going to see Satan unmasked for who he really is in this fifth judgment. And so this star or Satan fallen from heaven was given the key or the authority to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Um, the, the word shaft here means pit or shaft or well. And, and um, uh, the, the fact that it's bottomless is it's literally the abyss or, or the, you know, the, the um, infallible depth. <laughs> um, so Satan is given authority over a certain number of demons that are in the abyss. Um, we know from other passages of Scripture that some of the, the angels, the, the demons, were bound by God after the flood and, and, and other times. And, and those, they have been bound in that place. Second Peter tells us they're bound and waiting God's judgment. But Satan here is given authority by God... <clears throat> to release these demonic forces on earth to bring about um, this judgment. And, you know, we see the, from that shaft smoke like the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. So the smoke out of the bottom, the abyss here, darkens the whole earth. Um, you know, my kids live in Idaho and there's been all those wildfires out there in California and, and Washington and, and the smoke drifts over into northern Idaho where David lives and, and for most of this summer you can't go outside, you can't climb mountains like he likes to do or, or exercise because the, the air quality is so bad and it's just dim all the time um, you know from that smoke um, from time to time it clears but um, it's been getting better lately but I thought you know it's like this smoke of darkness comes over the world. Uh, and then the creatures uh, who, who it says are like locusts, but with the power of scorpions um, uh, come out. And I believe these are de demonic creatures, locusts with scorpion-like stings. Um, and interesting, if you know about locusts, what do locusts do? Well, they eat everything that's green. <laughs> but in this judgment, they're told not to touch Anything, any of the green plants on earth, um, very unlike a locust. Uh, instead, they're given permission to attack the people who don't have the mark of God on their head. Um, and so, you know, whereas the first four judgments are on the earth itself, uh, resulting in, in deaths of people, no doubt, the last three are going to be on humankind. Um, so they have the power of scorpions, um, and, and they are to harm only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, you know. There's going to be a great reversal in the tribulation, you know. We're used to living in a world system dominated by Satan, and we always feel like we're in the minority. We always feel like, you know, they've got the upper hand. But in the tribulation, things are going to be reversed, um, 
It's believers who are going to be protected, and unbelievers are going to be exposed to God's wrath. Um, so much so. And, it, and it's a terrible torment here. It, it, it's literally a torment or a torture for five months. They weren't allowed to kill them, but they could torture or torment them for five months. And it says in verse 6, in those days people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. This is a horrible, horrible, horrible judgment. Um, and it gives a description of them like horses prepared for battle, crowns of gold, something like crowns of gold, human faces, women's hair, lion's teeth, breastplates of iron, noises, noisy wings, um, tails that sting like scorpions. Um, and, and then it gives us um, not only their hideous appearance, but um, their king. And they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he's called Apollyon, which mean, both of which mean destruction or destroyer. Can I remind us that Satan is a destroyer? That's his business. You know, we, we live in an age of grace where, where the restraint of the Holy Spirit is on the world, but someday that's going to be removed. But Satan's character doesn't change. Satan is just as much a destroyer today. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy everything he can. Oh, and that is only going to get worse during the tribulation. He wants to destroy our marriages. He wants to destroy our families. He wants to destroy this church. He is the destroyer. We have a mighty foe. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be sobered by that. Oh, thank God that he is mightier. And then in verses uh, 12 and uh, 19 is the sixth trumpet judgment. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I think I put the first woe, but it's really the second woe. Um, the first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew uh, his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. Does God have a plan? We're released to kill a third of mankind. I hope we can take that in. You know, there's... I think I, I looked it up, something like 7.7 .7 billion people on earth. This would be the equivalent to almost 2 billion people being wiped out. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000 or 200 million. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates of color of fire um, and of sapphire, so red sapphire blue dark blue and of sulfur yellow and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths fire is red smoke is dark blue and sulfur is yellow but these plagues by these plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails for their tails are like serpent serpents with heads and by means of them they wound so there's this announcement of the sixth trumpet and then the command to release the four angels. I think these are no doubt demons um, bound, who have been bound. Um, God's angels are never bound at Euphrates. And they lead an immense demonic-led army. I don't know if the army is human beings or, or demons. I'm not sure. Um, and then we are given their hideous appearance and their method of killing with fire, smoke, and sulfur. Um, Again, a terrible, terrible judgment. Um, the judgments are intensifying as we go. Um, you know, probably the most shocking verses in these two chapters are the last two. Because in spite of all of this, the human beings on earth refuse to repent. You know, part of the reason for God's judgment is not only to judge and punish sin, it is also to give an opportunity for repentance. And their hearts are so hardened that they refuse to repent. 
the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk um, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts um, you know I just I, I want to say that there's so there's a lot of lessons for this for us um you know, I can't help read this without asking why all these judgments on unbelievers. Um, you know, God's wrath against sin and his just punishment and his love for sinners. Um, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's heart. Um, this, is a, this is God's opportunity for, for repentance. You know, this is the final victory over Satan and sin on earth so that God's kingdom can come in all its fullness. God's kingdom entered into this world with Jesus Christ, who declared, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the king is here. Um, and his kingdom is active in the church of Jesus Christ today. Um, but one day it's going to come in its fullness. And we are going to have perfect righteousness, perfect government, you know, a perfect ruler in Jesus Christ himself, the Prince of Peace. So we live in an already not yet uh, tension. And because of that, when we see wicked, blatant, evil, and evil people, I don't know about you, but I get angry. There's within me a cry to, uh, and maybe a demand for justice. God, deal with it. You know, remove it. Let your goodness and righteousness and love reign. You know, someday God will deal with it. In the meantime, we live in a broken world that's marred by sin. And that's not God's fault. That's our fault. It's been our fault from Adam onward. You see, God provided the solution to sin in Jesus Christ at the great cost of the sacrifice, uh, that of his sacrifice for sin. But when we reject it, we expose ourselves to God's wrath instead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's God's offer. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's the reality, the tension that we live with today. Um, you know, I think we need to have a healthy fear of God in our lives, brothers and sisters. We need to put him first in our lives. That's wisdom. We need to put his commands and his mission as first in our priority list. We need to recognize his hatred of sin and our need to live holy lives. And praise God, we can because of Christ. We need to reach out to those without Christ and in, name, and in danger of eternal judgment. You know, there's a lot of fear today. You know, some, something we should fear more than cancer or COVID or heart disease or death. Jesus said we should fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And if we're without Christ, we have something far greater to fear. And that's eternal separation from God in a place of punishment. And I also want to say to us as believers... Be careful never, never, never to let your heart get hardened against God. Um, these people, these unbelievers, allowed their hearts to get so hardened that in spite of these terrible judgments, they refused to turn to him. I also want to say that, praise God, we live in an age of grace. Aren't you more thankful for it now? <laughs> We live in an era of opportunity. 
we have been freed from the Old Testament law no one could ever keep and brought under the new covenant of grace through Jesus. He did all the work. He paid the price to bring us freedom from bondage to sin and Satan. We have so much to be thankful for. We are indebted to the one who laid down his life for us. Let's not take it for granted. Uh Let's not live for ourselves or material things or comfort and convenience or self-indulgence. Let's let's become disciples of Christ. Let's live the adventurous life of faith. Let's lose our life for Christ that we can find it in the end. Are we living intentionally to share Christ and his life with those around us? You know, what are we waiting for? This tells us what is to come. Let's not waste our life. Let's invest our life in all we have for Jesus. We not only get joy now, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to bring some people with us as well. There is also, I think, hope for us. These judgments are on those who are in rebellion and hostile to God. But God's people, even these tribulation saints, are protected by God's seal. I believe, if my eschatology is right, that um, God's going to take us out in the rapture uh, or through death, and uh, and we're going to be spared this. But that should both sober and impel us to tell others um, that they can come with us. We know the end of the story, but many do not. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this message. I thank you for what you have done for us. God, it's hard to read um, the terrible judgments that are to come on this earth and on those who are in rebellion against you. But God, I thank you that you have given us a way out, a rescue plan. And his name is Jesus. We thank you that he has saved us. We thank you that he made the sacrifice for us. We thank you that he offers us his life, an eternal life, simply by trusting in him. And I would just pause to say this morning, if if you're here this morning and you've never come into a personal relationship with Christ, there is a very sobering reality of God's judgment that still stands over your heart and your life. He that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the only begotten Son of God. Please don't leave here today without trusting in Jesus and what he's done on the cross to save you. And for all of us as believers, I I just want to encourage us. Let's be bold in sharing the good news, God's rescue plan with others. And we thank you, Lord, for what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, stand. We're going to close out with two songs this morning, beginning with Revelation song, which is kind of appropriate. <laughs>
lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Have a good week.